So today we'll be Kevin Hendry who will talk about product structure of governances. Yes. Yep. Um, yes, so this is joined with 10 other people, including um, Pascal Golden, who sadly I forgot to include because I actually got the, some of the slides from, from him. Um, uh, but yeah, this was work that we did while we were um, together at Monash University. Um, okay. So, um, first off, um, let me um, explain what a strong product of graphs is. So, the strong, strong product of two graphs, G and H, is um, the graph whose vertex set is just the Cartesian, um, that should be the, Carte the Cartesian product of um, uh, uh, the vertex set of G and the vertex set of H. Um, and then we'll make two vertices adjacent um, if um, uh, in each coordinate they're either the same or they're neighbors. So here um, we have um, this, uh, can I get the <laughs> laser to move? Oh, oh, wait, maybe. <coughs> okay, maybe not. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, yes. <laughs> so here, if we take um, G to be this path of length three, and uh, okay, I'm gonna give up on this. Let's let's take <laughs> um, G to be a a path of length 3 and h to also be a path of length 3, then the strong product will look like this. So um, we've got uh, nine vertices and then they're adjacent. So for every edge from g um, uh, and edge of h, we sort of get this um, box with a cross in the middle um, for the four vertices corresponding to the Cartesian product of those two vertices. Um, so can you try oh. Oh. Uh, open the uh, what, uh, oh. uh, so uh, what should I <coughs> So this is the, th that's the strong product. Okay, so um, the other thing that's quite important to define early on is the tree width. Um, so a tree decomposition of graph is, um, consists of a tree together with a bag for every vertex of the tree so that um, the bags cover the vertices of the graph. And whenever you have a pair of adjacent vertices, they occur together in at least one bag. Um, that's the first condition. And the second condition says that for every vertex of the graph, the set of bags which contain that vertex should form a connected subtree of, um, of the tree T. So equivalently, if you have two, um, two vertices of the tree, um, then anything in the intersection of those two bags should also occur in every bag in the path between them. Um, okay. Um, uh, but there's actually another way to define tree width in terms of what are called K trees. So a K tree, um, uh, so to start with a clique of size K, so say maybe K equals three. Um, sorry, if K equals two. So a clique of size K plus one is a K tree. 
But then to build a bigger K tree, all we do is we select some uh, clique of size K and we add a new vertex adjacent to the vertices of that clique of size K. So if we started with, so as we build a one tree, we would start with a single edge and we'd keep on adding leaves. And you'll see that you can construct any tree this way. So a one tree is just a tree with at least two vertices. Um, but uh, in general, so, so here's, here's an example of a two tree, where if I start with a clique of size four, um, I can build a three tree like this. Um, and the nice property of a K tree is that um, the edge maximal graphs of tree width K um, are exactly the set of K trees. So um, this means that we can uh, define the tree width to be the, so we say that a graph has tree width the most K if and only if it is a subgraph of some K tree. Um, okay, and um, the, in order to convert between the two definitions, it's fairly straightforward. All we do is really, um, uh, basically we just have one uh, bag for every, um, uh, for each of the clicks of size um, k plus one. And because of how we construct the thing, they'll always form a tree-like structure like we need them to. So there's two equivalent definitions of tree width. Um, okay, so graph product structure theory aims to describe um, complicated graphs in terms of uh, strong products of simpler sorts of graphs. So this was initiated um, essentially by this result that um, I, Every planar graph is firstly, you can write it, you can find it as a subgraph of some graph H of tree with the most eight and take the strong product with a path. Um, or if you um, want to get the tree width down a bit further, you can take a tree width three graph, strong product of path, but then you also need strong product, just the graph K3. Um, so here, are, so these are two very useful structural theorems for um, planar graphs. And they've been applied now to problems such as book thickness and finding universal graphs and um, centered colorings and all sorts of things. But, um, but I won't go in, into any of that stuff in this talk. Um, but just, just know that there are lots of applications to this. It's really quite an interesting area of research. So the um, P is a path. He is a pup, yeah. I, I, yes, I should have, should have specified that. Uh, yes, if he, he is a pup. Um, okay, but um, note that even if the graph H is just a path and we take the strong product with another path, we will obtain a graph of high tree width because just the planar grid has high tree width. Um, and of course, uh, we can't avoid having a structure like this because we might actually be given the graph, of, which is a grid itself. So we can't avoid a structure theorem which gives us a graph of high tree width if we want to find every planar graph as a subgraph. But here's, here's a question. What if we are actually given a planar graph and we're given the additional information that the planar graph has bounded tree width? Then we could still apply this, um, this structural theorem, but we would always, we wouldn't have any guarantee that we would output a graph of bounded tree width, even though the input has bounded tree width. So the question is, can we, in this case, do something which is maybe a little bit better? Can we find um, a, uh, the graph as a subgraph of the strong product of two graphs H and H prime, where not just H and H prime have bounded tree width, but the strong product also has bounded tree width. And if we can do this, how simple can we make H and H prime? Because what we could do, of course, is just take the original graph and take the strong product with mm -hmm. a single vertex. And that would have bounded tree width. But can we somehow simplify the graph still? Um, okay. So 
Um, let me now talk about a slightly different sort of decomposition called a tree partition. So instead of a tree decomposition, now we still have um, a tree together with a collection of bags, but now um, the bags really form a partition of the vertex set. Um, and um, the so instead of every edge um, now being covered by some bag, um, each edge should now be covered by a pair of adjacent bags. Um, then we say that the width of this decomposition, uh, the width of this tree partition, is the size of the largest bag, and we find the tree partition width to be the um, the minimum width of a tree partition of a graph. Um, uh, okay. So, equivalently, a graph has tree partition width at most w if it is a subgraph of the strong product of a tree and a clique. And this is um, not too difficult to see. So, if I have um, a graph of tree partition width 2, um, say, so I might have um, some bags of size 2 and they're arranged together in some sort of clique, uh, in, in some sort of tree, sorry. So here is a, um, uh, and m maybe not every bag has size 2, but here's a tree partition of some graph where the size of the largest bag has size 2. And you see that I've only drawn edges between um, uh, bags in sort of a path-like structure. So the global structure is, is a tree. Um, but what you'll notice is that if I add, um, if I extend every bag so that it really contains two vertices, and I just add all of the allowable edges, then what I will actually get is just the strong product of, of a clique of size 2 together with the tree. <clears throat> so these are really, really equivalent. So uh, when we talk about tree partitions, we're really doing a sort of graph product structure um, type thing. Um, OK, so here's a really nice result about uh, tree partitions. So if we have a graph of bounded tree width, so tree width at most k, and bounded maximum degree at most delta, then this graph is a subgraph of the strong product of some tree together with this clique, where the size of the clique is just dependent on k and delta. And um, the dependence on k and delta is really optimal in this theorem. Um, OK, so this is exactly the sort of result we're looking for, because um, uh, Tree, uh, bounded tree partition width does actually imply bounded tree width. So if we find, so this is a strong product theorem where the global structure that we get does have bounded tree width. And to see this, um, if we take this um, uh, tree partition, in order to convert it into a tree decomposition, all we need to do is take one bag for every, um, every edge of the partition tree. And then we form a new tree by just taking um, a spanning tree of the line graph. And this will give us a tree decomposition from the initial tree partition. And the width only grew by a factor of two, because we just take <coughs> pairs of adjacent um, parts to form our bags. So bounded tree partition width does imply bounded tree width. Um, so that's nice. Unfortunately, um, uh, the converse does not hold for planar graphs. So what does this mean? So if I have a graph of bound, a planar graph even, of bounded tree width, it does not necessarily have bounded tree partition width. And the example is um, this graph that we call a fan. So a fan just consists of a path um, uh, together with a vertex adjacent to everything in the path. And what we find is that, um, so suppose for contradiction that this fan on 10 vertices 
has um, uh, some tree partition uh, of width at most two. Um, then what we can say is that, well, there, there, there will be some bag containing this top vertex, um, but if we look at these three subparts of length three, um, uh, not, not all of these subparts can contain a vertex in the same bag as this one, or else this bag is too big. Which means that, for, without loss of generality, this bag doesn't contain anything from the red bag. Um, but then also, I said that we're aiming for tree partition with the most two, <coughs> which means that these three vertices can't all be in the same bag, which means that there's a pair of adjacent vertices in different bags. So now I've got some orange bag containing one vertex and some green bag containing another vertex. And then we see that, um, well, there's an edge between this bag and this bag, and between this bag and this bag, and between this bag and this bag, so the global structure couldn't possibly be a tree. And this generalizes to show that the tree partition width of a fan is something like the square root of the number of vertices. So in particular, not bounded. Even though the tree width of this structure is just two, in fact, this is exactly a two trip. So, sorry, the, the construction you, you told us about the other one before, which is, I mean, the computing the tree width from the oh, yes. tree partition width, yes. is it optimal? Um, hmm, I, I, think, I think so. Uh, I mean, oh. as in like, the, in the worst case, it should be, should, it, it, I think it can grow by this factor of two, yeah. The worst case, but in general case, it can be smaller. Yeah, I guess, I guess in general, well, it's yeah, so here, <laughs> here, yeah, exactly here, right? Here, the, the tree partition width is, is something like three here, where, oh, well, in general, n uh, square root n, whereas it shrinks down to, to, yeah, two for the tree width. Um, yeah, so it's only the worst case where you get this gap. But yeah, in particular, yeah, we do, all we really care is that we do get this bound on the tree width for now. Um, okay, so uh, tree partitions are nice, but they're not good enough in terms of getting us the full structural result where we want for planar graphs. So where do we go from here? Um, uh, okay, so instead of a tree partition now, um, why not take a k-tree partition? So um, here, uh, it's basically the same as the definition of tree partition, except we place, replace tree with k-tree. So um, yeah, instead of, so now we have some underlying uh, k-tree h, and then a bag for each of the vertices of the k-tree. Um, and the bags form the partition of the vertex set, and every edge either lies between two adjacent bags or is in, contained in some bag. And again, the width is of, the, of the partition is just the size of the largest bag. The, width, uh, the partition width of the graph is the minimum width of a, part, of a, of a K-tree partition. Um, okay. Um, and again, we have this equivalent formulation it is exactly um, equivalent to being uh, a subgraph of a strong product of now a k-tree together with um, uh, a complete graph. And if we wanted, we could replace k-tree by just saying it's equivalent to being a subgraph of just a graph of tree width um, and most k together with a complete graph because we have just taken the biggest graphs of tree width and most k. Um, okay, and, and the good news is that the same argument as before still gives us a bound on the tree width in terms of the k tree partition width. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so because the, um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit more technical maybe, but the tree width really doesn't grow very much when you take 
uh, this blow up. Um, the same same idea sort of sort of works. Um, okay, <coughs> so motivated by these K tree partitions, we'll now define a new parameter of a graph class. So the underlying tree width of a graph class is the minimum integer c such that um, essentially every graph in the class can be um, uh, has bounded c partition width in terms of the tree width of the graph. So um, this means that if we take um, the uh, the subclass of graphs of tree width the most k, we should have bounded c tree c tree partition width for that subclass for any fixed k. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Uh, hopefully, it will become more clear um, if it's not clear already. Um, okay, so to get some, start getting some lower bounds on this um, underlying tree width notion, or um, these, or or just in general, like getting some lower bounds for C tree partition widths of some graphs. Um, well, so first of all, we already found. Um, a graph of tree width two, um, which uh, has um, unbounded uh, uh, two tree partition width. Uh, sorry, it has unbounded. Wait, it has unbounded tree partition width. I think these numbers are going to be off by one. Um, so <coughs> what we can actually do is. Um, If we have some graph of uh, with large uh, C tree partition width, then we can take um, uh, many copies of this graph. So let's start with a fan. Let's take many copies of a fan. Let's do this. Um, L times or L plus one times. And then if we add a new vertex adjacent to all of the vertices that we've drawn so far, oh. um, then what we find is that um, uh, the new graph, um, we can run a similar argument as before. So if we suppose for contradiction that this has bounded um, C plus 1 partition width, then when we look at the bag which contains this vertex, it must be disjoint from one of the copies because there's too many copies. Um, but then, within the copy, um, we must find that, um, uh, so since these graphs have unbounded C tree partition width, um, if we want bags of bounded size, then the structure should have tree width at least C plus 1. And then the structure, when you add one dominant vertex to whatever uh, to whatever graph you get in here, this bag has to be adjacent to all of the bags inside this picture, so it will always increase the tree width by one. So if you add a dominant vertex to a graph, it's important to, to, to know that the, um, the tree width will always increase, and always by exactly one. So is the plus one typo? Oh, probably. Uh, which plus one? <laughs> uh, plus nine. Uh, the, so the tree width of eight, yeah, H C comma L plus one. So maybe the L plus one, L plus one must be in the subscript. No, 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 no. No, this this is exactly the point. So 
What do they do? So, we'll, so the brackets should be at a different. Um, maybe the brackets should be in a different. Yeah. Oh. Which brackets? On the fourth line. At the end. So it's the the true bit of H. Oh yeah, sorry, that's a good point. Yes, <laughs> there we go. Now I now you're you're exactly right. The brackets. Yeah. Yes. Graph, graph so so the plus one, one, it's not meant to be in the subscript, but the brackets meant to shift over. So what 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 I mean to say is that ah. the tree width of the new construction is exactly one more than oh, the tree width of the I previous see. construction. See, see. Because taking disjoint copies doesn't change the tree width, mm -hmm. but adding the dominant vertex increases it by exactly one. And um, so uh, as a result of this, what we find is that um, so the class of graphs of tree width C really has underlying tree width C um, because um, what we have is a construction of tree width C with um, unbounded C minus one tree partition width. So um, so if we if the class of graphs has tree width, uh, if we look at the whole class of graphs of tree width C in particular it contains these obstructions. And a second um, observation is that if we look at the entire class of graphs, the underlying tree width is not bounded because we have, so for any, um, uh, for any fixed C, we have a graph of bounded tree width where the C tree partition width is not bounded. Um, and then the third observation uh, comes from the specific way that this construction is built, what we find is that the graph that I've drawn here is planar. If, this, if all of these bags are fans and we just add one vertex adjacent to everything. And what this means is that um, the underlying tree width of the class of planar graphs is at least three, because this construction does not have bounded two tree partition width. Okay, so those are those are how we, and there, there's um, yeah, that's the main way of getting lower bounds for for, for these sort of results. Um, uh, okay, so, um, so previously, um, we had this nice result that if you have a graph of bounded maximum degree and bounded tree width, you get bounded, um, tree partition width. Um, now, of course, uh, if we have, uh, we can't in general hope for a bounded maximum degree. So, what condition should we hope for if we're trying to just, instead of get bounded, getting bounded tree partition width, we're just hoping for bounded C tree partition width? Um, and the answer is something like this. So, this is quite a. Uh, complicated definition when you first see it, I guess. Um, uh, um, but um, let me maybe do an example, uh, starting with a graph um, of bounded um, two tree partition width. So, um, Okay, so here's a global structure which is a two tree, and then maybe um, inside each bag I have at most three vertices, and um, of course I'm only allowed to draw edges either in inside a bag or between adjacent bags. Okay, um, so. Um, uh, if we have a um, uh, a three two tree partition, uh, so so here we have um, a partition of the vertex of the graph where all of the parts have size at most three. Okay, so that's that's what we get from a, a two tree partition of width at most three. Um, so what we want is the following, so that um, so if c equals 2, whenever we delete um, two of the um, 
two of the parts, so if I select this part and this part, and I remove these, and then I look at a component of what's left over, so this, this pair of vertices happens to split the graph into two components, this component and this component. So let me just focus on this one here. What I want is to find a bounded size set of vertices which separates the neighbors of this set, let's call this S1, from the neighbors of this set, let's call it S2. Okay. So in this particular picture, what you'll see is that the, um, the only allowable common neighbors of S2 and S1 in this component are in this bag here. <coughs> Um, so, we take this bag here to be the set, oh dear, uh, we take this bag here to be the set Q. Now, what the definition says is that once we delete Q and then look at the subcomponents of this component, um, each of those should, uh, should not contain uh, neighbours of both of these. They, so we, we have one, we, we might contain neighbors of S2, but we shouldn't also contain neighbors of S1. Um, so, and, um, and you note that this, this choice of this bag here works even if the picture is a bit, um, is a bit more complicated. So I might have another bag up here and extend up here, oh dear. I'm really not doing this very well. Um, um, so I might have more bags here, so that all of these were in the same component. Um, but still, there, there should be some bag which separates these two. Now, and essentially, when these two are adjacent, um, uh, you should always take whichever bag is in the clique containing them. So. The, the structure of the of the C tree will will give you that this um, separates exactly what we want it to according according to this. Um, so uh, and then, then yeah. Yeah. If C was much larger, were there like possible multiple neighbors? Because then you want. To yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, I, I can draw a, a three tree. I, I don't want to go too much larger because they're just difficult to draw. But three trees are so uh, also somewhat nice to draw on a plane. Um, so here's a lake of size four, and I can just keep on. Um, adding vertices like this, and imagine that these bags have some size. Um, so now, um, uh, there's sort of two cases. Um, so either you select, so the condition is that whenever we select um, C bags, so in this case, three bags, um, so if we select three bags like this, which form a clique, then Every component of what's left over should only contain at most one common neighbor of these three. Um, uh, so here, um, the we might have like this, um, but the common neighbor of these three is this central bag here, and you'll notice that this central bag will separate. Um, all of what's left over into something here, something here, and something here. But this only has neighbors of these two, this only has neighbors of these two, and this only has neighbors of these two. So this is what we want the pictures to look like. Um, and if, if we instead selected, um, uh, so suppose that I instead didn't select three things that formed a clique, so I instead selected maybe this one out here. 
Um, then if they're not in a clique, but it's a C tree, we actually have a, um, a separation. So we can actually separate this vertex from this vertex by deleting at most three of the other <coughs> bags. Mm -hmm. And if we really separate them in the graph by deleting a bound, um, uh, only a bounded number of bags, then in particular, no component of what's left over can contain neighbors of this one and neighbors of this one. So this is actually the easier case. The more complicated cases where they really do form a clique, but then the structure really tells us what to do. That we just look for other things which are in the same clique. But in the second case, you are kind of cheating. If you take two bags and both can contain D elements, your Q would have two D, so... Uh, so I just require that... Oh, so, so, no, I, I, I didn't... So, right. So in this case, D might equal two times L or three times L. We don't really care as long as D is bounded. So in this case, I, I should be able to take D equal to two times L, I think. Mm, okay. So, yeah. So L is the size of the bags, but it's, it's really... We can take D to be whatever we like. Okay. So, um, so looking at these um, C trees sort of motivates why we care about a condition like this. So if we get a graph which has bounded C tree partition width, we automatically know that um, it should be C D disjointed where D is bounded by something like two times the width or C times the width, maybe something like this. Um, now, okay. Um, but yeah, we're, um, the, 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 the good news is that actually this is a complete characterization. Um, so, uh, given any, um, fixed C, uh, and a bounded tree width graph, we sort of, everything will break <coughs> if, if we don't have bounded tree width. Um, then a graph has bounded C tree partition width if and only if um, it has a CD disjointed partition. Um, and really the, the, um, the, the main ideas of this proof um, were already um, very, very similar to the proof that did the tree partition, uh, the, if you have bounded maximum degree. So once we, once we figured out what the right sort of generalization of it was, I won't say it was completely trivial because I know it was, uh, it, it was still some work, but um, uh, the ideas for it um, were sort of, yeah, really, really borrowing from that proof. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I, I won't prove this here. I, uh, many of you will have seen Pascal's talk where he, where he went through the proof of this. It's, it's, it's quite technical. It's, it's quite a nice proof, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I won't go through it yet. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to talk about some of the applications of this result. So once we have this um, uh, characterization in terms of these uh, C, D disjointed partitions, it really opens up for us to get these... Uh, um, these bounds on these on the underlying tree with many many classes of graphs. So, um, so firstly, if we consider the graphs which exclude, act, oh, uh, have I, I just come back. Uh, KS, a KST minus so a complete graph with sides of sides S and T, um, where you think of T as being the larger side of the um, of the bipartition, or you know otherwise T at least three technically, um, then the underlying tree width of the class of KST minor free graphs is really equal to three. Um, and in particular, uh, if we look at a KST minor free graph of tree width the most K, then the um, S tree partition width um, is something like K squared log K, is, or, or the K squared log K. Um, and this, this is proved using these um, C tree partitions, and you can actually take the partition just to be the singleton partition. 
And you can show that um, if you take the singleton partition, then you, you can really um, uh, delete a bounded number of vertices in each component uh, to separate only three. Uh, one, yeah. So, so maybe I should. Uh, Ah. Yeah, so the goal is if we take the singleton partition now, so I've got some graph and it's KST free, um, then if I uh, look at any three vertices, um, UVW. <coughs> and I look at some component of what's left over, then I want to delete a bounded number of vertices inside this component so that um, the, the sort of subcomponents here each only see at most two of the vertices. Um, and um, uh, the, the idea for proving this uses um, sort of an Erdős poser type argument where uh, we look at all of the we, we try and find a, a collection of disjoint um, subgraphs inside this component which sort of link up um, the three vertices uh, and then we show that um, if you have many disjoint subgraphs linking the three vertices, then, well, we would just create a K3 T minor. Uh, so this is if S equals three. This, the, the reason I drew three vertices was I was taking S to equal three. Um, but in general, you, this works if, w whatever the value of S is. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have many disjoint um, subgraphs which sort of link these three vertices together, then you just contract each of them to a single vertex to build a K S T minor or K three T minor in this case. Um, and if you don't have them, then there's an Erdős Poser result which just allows you to find a small set which hits all of the subgraphs that look like this, which means that all of the remaining components don't link the three together in, in the sense that they contain at most neighbors of two of them. Uh, so that's just a very, uh, very rough sketch of, of how that proof works. Um, um, but with this result, we immediately um, are able to calculate the underlying tree width of graphs embeddable on any fixed surface. Because um, uh, in particular, the lower bound works the same as for planar graphs. Um, planar graphs can be embedded on any fixed surface. Um, but the upper bound works just because um, uh, for every s fixed surface, uh, there is some constant t such that uh, the graph K3t cannot be embedded on the surface. Um, and this is, this is good news for us, so now we can finally address the motivating question I posed near the start of the talk. So there exists a function f such that every planar graph of tree width k is a subgraph of h times um, a clique of size f of k um, for some three tree h. Um, and now the tree width of this entire construction will just be something like three times the size of this clique. So it will be bounded in terms of the tree width of the original graph. But <coughs> it's quite a nice simple structure of the type we're looking for. Okay, um, so uh, let me talk briefly about a few other applications. So um, uh, an interesting observation is that, so if C is at least two, um, and we take a subdivision of some graph G, then uh, in particular, we cannot decrease the uh, C tree partition width of, of a graph that we're looking for. And I won't give an actual proof of this, but um, let's just do sort of a, 
a simple case. So here is a, um, if you look at this graph here, this is a two tree. So in particular, the two tree partition width is one. But imagine that we uh, subdivided the edges of this graph. Well, in order to subdivide an edge, what I can do is just paste a clique onto the edge and then paste another clique onto that clique and paste another clique onto that clique. And I'm just building a larger C tree at the moment. But now I can sort of delete the original edge and reroute through all of this stuff that I've just added on and suddenly I've subdivided the edge. But I didn't have to increase the partition width. In order to do this, I just pasted on some more bags, essentially. Uh, this is a very rough idea of... This is not a complicated thing. It's a little bit... Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to give a formal proof of this, but it, it's not too complicated an idea. An idea. Um, and it's not too unintuitive that subdividing really shouldn't increase how complicated the structure is um, in this sense. Um, but it has um, uh, an immediate consequence that, um, so if we are interested in the class of k-planar graphs, so these are graphs which can be drawn so that um, every edge is crossed at most k times, um, then the class of, uh, even the class of one planar graphs has unbounded underlying tree width. Because we can take our favorite family of obstructions and then just subdivide all of the edges of these obstructions until they can be drawn so that every edge is crossed at most once. So you take a you favorite drawing with arbitrary crossings and you just subdivide around the crossings to get a one planar graph. Um, but because we've just subdivided, we didn't increase the C tree partition width. Uh, Is that the right direction? I may have gone in the wrong direction there. Um, in any case, the, the corollary is still true, that the class of one planar graphs does have unbounded underlying tree width. That's when you assume that there is a class of graphs of unbounded. Yes, so that we are using this result from before, that the uh -huh. class of all graphs does have unbounded underlying tree width. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but interestingly, um, the class of outer K planar graphs has um, uh, bounded two tree partition width. So the class of outer k planar graphs has underlying tree width two. So an outer k planar graph is a graph which can be drawn um, in the plane so that the outer face contains all of the vertices of the graph. So I may as well draw them in a cycle just by adding some edges around if they're not there. And then the inside edges, each inside edge is crossed at most k times. So here, maybe I'll draw it so that each edge is crossed at most two times. So this is an outer k planar graph, or an outer two planar graph, maybe. Maybe, maybe it's even an... Uh, well, it just crossed three times. Oh, okay, outer three planar graph. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. Um, uh, but in order to show that the two tree partition width of this is bounded, all we need to do is find a, um, a 2D disjointed partition. And again, my claim is that the singleton partition is 2D disjointed. And the way this argument works is, okay, so imagine that we delete a pair of vertices, um, say so u and v here. Um, then I need to find a set q such that um, inside every, so uh, inside every component I need to find a bounded, bounded size set q um, where now there's it splits the neighbors from u from the neighbors of v. Um, but this is quite simple to do. So all I'll need to do is I look, I look around the cycle. So I look, first um, I go clockwise from V, and I go, as, I go to the furthest neighbor of V before I get to U, clockwise around the cycle. And I 
consider this edge between you and whatever this vertex here is. Let's call it B1. And I do the same thing going around the other side. So maybe I go like to here. Maybe this is the furthest edge going around before I get to you around the other side. And then all I need to do is take, um, well, there are most uh, k edges which cross this edge. And there are most k edges which cross this edge. Which means I can take all of the endpoints of all of these edges and all of the endpoints of all of these edges, and I've only got 2k, um, uh, so I've only got 4k vertices there. Um, and then I can throw in this vertex and throw in this vertex. And you can see that any path which goes from u to v must, uh, must use one of the, must use one of these edges which crosses this edge because of how we selected it. Um, because the first edge that we take on the path has to be underneath this edge, just because of our selection. And then somehow we need to get to U, and however we get to U, we will eventually have to cross this edge. So if we take these endpoints to be our separating set, we've hit all of the paths from U to V, so we we find a set Q such that once you remove it, you shouldn't have any component containing a neighbor of U and V. Because if you had such a component, you would find this path which avoids Q. Um, so, yeah, the, I don't know how much the picture helped. Or, but, uh, but yeah, this, this was sort of, I think this was one of my favorite applications of the, um, of the, C tree, uh, the CD decompositions of like, how we can really, how, how useful they are to really sort of get these results quite easily. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, I'll just briefly, um, briefly skim through some of our other results. So we also considered um, graphs excluding a fixed subgraph. So um, we found that a, um, a class of graphs excluding a fixed subgraph has bounded underlying tree with if and only if um, every component of the graph is what we call a spider. So a spider is just some star with, uh, where the edges are allowed to be subdivided. For a forest where each component has at most one vertex of degree more than two. Um, uh, so if you exclude such a subgraph, then you will have bounded underlying tree with, but if you um, exclude any other graph, then you won't have unbounded, then you will have unbounded underlying tree width. Um, Do you assume that H is binary? Uh, uh, for the, so, right, yeah, if we consider a set of graphs, which we, if we exclude a set of graphs, uh, yeah, so set H, yeah, so. Do we assume that, uh, probably we should. Probably that's meant to say finite. Do you remember? I, 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 at least the proof, proof that I have in my head would assume yeah. that it's finite. I, I, I think that's just... Otherwise, I, I could uh, like just list all possible extensions which are not spider. Yeah, maybe you can list all cycles otherwise. Yeah, yeah, so if you forbid all cycles, then of course you will get just trees. And trees mm -hmm. do have bounded one tree partition width. Oh, right. So, so yes, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. definitely need to assume finite. Um, but... The, the argument to show that you need to exclude a spider is essentially, otherwise you can just subdivide the graph until it doesn't contain anything else. So, um, yeah. So if your graph contains a cycle, then you can find a graph of large girth with high C tree partition width just by subdividing all the edges of some obstruction. And if the graph has two vertices of high degree in the same component, again, you can just subdivide the path between them until we no longer contain it as a subgraph. Um, and the other direction is, is um, much more complicated. Um, and we sort of use the full strength of the, of this CD de decompositions to prove the, the other direction or to get the tight result in the other direction. Um, but we do get a tight result. Um, so if you forbid, um, forbid just one subgraph and that subgraph is a path, 
then the underlying tree width of the class of graphs is just log of the length of the path. And if um, uh, you forbid some spider with um, s legs, each of length t, um, uh, then the underlying tree width will be um, uh, just log of the... Oh yeah, sorry, there's a minus one for the paths, there's a plus one for the, for the other spiders. If, if uh, yeah, so if that's a spider with at least three legs. So do you have exact bounds? Like that this, this, these, these are tight, these, these bounds are tight. Uh -huh. I so think if, if you allow spiders with varying lengths of legs, then we maybe don't always get quite exactly the tight bound. Uh -huh. um, or we, maybe we didn't write uh, what the exact bound should be, but if all the legs are the same size, then we really precisely calculated what the underlying tree width should be. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a nice inductive argument, um, which, which does this, but, uh, but it's a bit too complicated to go into, um, <laughs> particularly in, in the final minute of the talk. Um, so I'll just um, um, mention uh, uh, one last thing. So um, uh, yeah, so if we forbid an induced subgraph, then again we get um, uh, bounded underlying tree width if and only if now each component really is a star. So the um, we can no longer take spiders when we look at induced subgraphs. And um, yeah, so we get um, these uh, more precise calculations so that uh, if we exclude um, a path on at most three vertices uh, or exclude some graph without any edges, then, um, then we would get underlying tree width zero, which is sort of a strange um, thing, but it's, it's uh, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, if we, we otherwise get bounded, um, a one tree partition width, if we, um, uh, if each component is um, a star or path on most three vertices, and then two if, uh, if we have any other star forest. Okay, um, and, and that's, that, that's all I have prepared, so. Thank you, any questions? Can you do similar stuff for passes or for the way to the graph? Yeah, so in, in, um, uh, in the appendix of the online version of this paper, um, we, uh, we discuss what happens if you, instead of talk about underlying tree width, maybe the underlying path width. Um, I think, I th did we find, I think bandwidth was trivial. I can't remember what, what the story is for path width. We, some of the results for tree width sort of translate, I think. That's, uh, we, have, we do say something about it. I can't remember what we say about path width. What was the other thing you mentioned? Oh, vertex weighted graphs. Oh, interesting. Um, what could we say about vertex weighted graphs? Um, so, a tree decomposition of a vertex weighted graphs, I guess you just take the weight of the bags instead. But now we don't get this characterization in terms of these. K trees, I guess, or we maybe have to redefine K trees to have be weighted K trees. <laughs> I'm not. I, I don't know what happens with vertex weighted graphs. I hadn't. I haven't thought about it. That's an interesting question. So I also have a question. So initial motivation you gave us is mm -hmm. that if you do these big competitions, then you get something simpler, so you can understand what's really going on a bit better. Yeah. But the application you gave me was it more like. You are taking the 
I mean, it was not quite up to that expectation, I thought, because the application was mostly about the showing... The oh, yeah, I sort of, like I did, um, <coughs> yeah. I, I haven't done much, like I, so, I did applications of the main lemma, but not of the... Right. I didn't show you how to apply any of the actual That's results right. that we get. So yeah. is there any, like, some independent results, which may be about some different, I mean, from different, and the people ask that question, which can be answered if I know that some graph class has, like, a bounded underlying tree width, and also if I know your function f, which maps tree width to the... This, uh, yeah, I, I think this is something that I'm interested in looking into more, but I, at the moment we sort of, we're just really, you know, focused on trying to figure out what we could actually say, and then we, I, I, I don't know, I think we sort of haven't gotten around to the thing of, like, actually is this useful? Um, I, I think it should be. I, 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 I would expect, and there are some small things that I was sort of looking at how these other product structure things are applied, and um, and I think like in some cases there are some things we can say which it's not clear how interesting they are. Like they, they do give some bounds which are sort of more refined than than you get without these theorems. But then there are conjectures that sort of the the bound the bounds we get from this shouldn't be tight. So, um, but I haven't looked in. I've only looked at like a couple of things. I haven't, and I don't. I'm not really an expert in in the application of the strong product stru structure theory stuff, so I, I'm sort of just like uh, coming newly to the literature and trying to see like if there's anything immediately that falls out. And um, yeah, I, have, um, I don't have any I don't have any insights yet. Into, into into one more time. I mean, like if I suppose I have a some arbitrary graph. Yep. But I decomposed it into this K tree strong product with a complete kind of complete graph. Yep. So now if I just only look at this uh, K tree part, okay. Can you say something interesting about the original graph? I mean, maybe I'm re repeating the same question because if I know the decomposition, the, the, the complete graph part is, doesn't mean say anything about it. But on the other hand, the K tree part potentially say something interesting about the original graph. Mm -hmm. So does that say anything? Um, useful or I mean, I mean, of course, they maybe say useful, but this, um, do you know of any? So, wait, um, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, of course, the, uh, the, the interesting thing I can tell you about the graph is that it has bounded, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's, yeah, I, 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 it's kind of redundant. It, yeah. as a, so it's like some through away, some information, but keeps maybe some other information. So, I guess you, um, Hmm. Are, are you supposing that you have like an optimal uh, decomp? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean you, you would just say it can be embedded into this strong product, yeah. right? So now suppose, because the first, second component of strong product doesn't say very much, it just say complete graph. Yeah. yeah. So it's the interesting part is the first component. Yeah. So now, and then it's relatively simple because it's either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like I mean, it's bounded tree width. It's, yeah, it's yeah. very, like, there's a lot of things you can say about graphs of bounded tree width. Ah, so um, then that can be transferred to the original graph? Well, yeah, the original graph also has bounded tree width, like, but I guess that was part of one of the assumptions in order to get to this structure. Um, but, yeah, so this is like, I guess... Um, tree tree is a degree D or something, then does that translate something about the root graph? Um, I mean, it, it, yeah, I guess I don't know this, like, the answer, I guess, is yes, in the sense that that's why people study okay. strong product graph, uh, graph theory, uh, uh, a product structure or graph theory. Like, uh, in some sense, there should be something that people can say that I don't, I, I, I'm not, not really an expert in, in the sorts of things. Like, I know the, there's, applic yeah, so, you should get some results, I think, for like um, maybe p centered colorings or um, <clears throat> maybe some things like this. Uh, I don't know yet. But, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly which settings 
are the most promising in terms of applying these results. Okay. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. If I'm given a, let's say, a planar graph of bounded tree width, and let's say I want to find the, compute this uh, part the partition width, let's say, uh -huh. I will limit it. Is it? To get the precise calculation or of Or just decide whether mm -hmm. it's uh, like K tree partition width. So I guess, or yeah, or yeah. So, so what we get is, um, I think for, um, for planar graphs, um, so we get this um, k squared log k. Uh, although maybe this was, there was some recent email from David that somewhere in the paper there's a log k factor which should be removed. Maybe oh. this is it. Um, so maybe it's k <laughs> squared. Um, uh, to, to actually compute the decomposition which achieves this bound, um, I think it. I, I think every. I think the proofs are algorithmic, so I think they. Uh, and yet, for this bound, I would. Yeah, I think think you would get mm. an algorithm, an algorithm for getting this. Mm. At least, it's not obvious. I I can't think of where in the proof it should fail. Um, yeah. But so far, there's no non-trivial way known to actually decide a given a uh, graph of bounded tree width to have uh, uh, S3 partition with M mod L? Or? Um, <coughs> I, I think that maybe not. You know, may, maybe not many people have looked at it, <laughs> so um, but yeah, I, I don't know what, the, what the, mm -hmm. uh, these algorithms are used. How about taking bias? Does it increase C three partition this or? No? Um, does taking bias increase C three partition width? It can. So, um, in particular, the fan. Uh, wait. Yes. So, if I have this graph. Um, This graph has uh, bounded one tree partition width. I can just take um, facts like this of size two, and sort of the quotient graph is just the path. However, if I contract the top row, I get a fan which does not have bounded one tree partition width. Right. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker.